Hello, everyone, and welcome to the May edition of the virtual seminar series on central banking and digital currencies. Before we start today's session, I want to make a brief announcement. As you can see on the screen here in November, the Ricks Bank will be hosting a second conference on the economics of CBDC, organized jointly with the Bank of Canada and with a small measure of support by our virtual seminar series. I think this conference will be of particular interest to people in the audience, and I hope that if you have a paper on CBDC, uh, you'll consider submitting it. As you can see, the submission deadline is four weeks away on June 15th, and for more information about how to submit and about the conference itself, the QR code here will take you to the call for papers on the Ricks Bank webpage. Turning to today's session, our uh, moderator for today is Larry Wall from the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. And so now I'll turn it over to you, Larry. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, as uh, whichever is appropriate. Uh, today, we're delighted to have Christopher Birch, uh, a senior economist in the research division of the Swedish Central Bank, the Riksbank, present his paper, Stable Coins, Adoption and Fragility. He will have 25 minutes. Christoph, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Larry. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. I think you now you should be able to see the slides. Um, thanks a lot, Larry, for the kind introduction and thanks to the CBNDC webinar organizers for having me here and especially also to Alex to take the time to prepare a discussion on this paper. My paper uh, is on the topic of stable coins and it's motivated by the rapid expansion of the stable coins market, the inherent fragility of stable coins and uh, their role as a link between crypto markets and traditional financial markets. Uh, Stablecoins started to get a lot of attention after the uh, Facebook Libra announcement in June 2019, where uh, Facebook announced to uh, launch a global stablecoin backed by a basket of currencies. And this was a wake up call for the regulatory community. Uh, while the Facebook Libra project was ultimately discontinued after the regulatory headwinds, the uh, stablecoin market uh, uh, continued to develop and uh, stablecoins play a critical role uh, in crypto markets. Uh, today's dominant stablecoins are Tether, US dollar coin, and Binance coin. Uh, they are all packed one-to-one -to, -one to the US dollar and uh, fully backed stablecoins. My paper is motivated by the following three questions. First, what are the reasons behind the fragility of stablecoins and what factors contribute to their fragility? Second, can stablecoin adoption be excessive? And third, how should stablecoins be regulated? To address these questions, I develop a theoretical model of stablecoins that allows me to analyze the determinants of stablecoin adoption and fragility. Uh, based on this framework, I'd like to contrast the beneficial role of stablecoins with the risk of stablecoin runs and potential downsides from wider adoption. Furthermore, I would like to shed light on prominent features of the stablecoins market, such as the role for payment preferences, transaction costs, uh, network effects, and all hazard problems with issuers. And last but not least, I'd like to gain insights for the risk assessment and appropriate regulation of stablecoins. Um, in a nutshell, what I'm doing is I'm uh, building a two-period model there's going to be an interim date, date which is featuring a stablecoin conversion game, which is modeled as a global game of regime change, and an ex ante date where I model a stablecoin adoptions game, uh, which is built on the premise that stablecoins offer a benefit for certain use cases to stablecoin holders, uh, and that the potential stablecoin holders are heterogeneous in how much they benefit from different means of payment. So the consumers, when deciding whether or not to adopt stablecoins, they are trading off the potential benefits of stablecoins uh, with a return differential relative to deposits um, and the risk of devaluations of stablecoins. In my model, I'm pretty agnostic uh, about how exactly uh, stablecoins are generating a benefit for their holders. Uh, the assumption has a clear motivation for stablecoin adopters who are interested in crypto applications. Their primary motive may be to uh, economize on transaction costs in the crypto universe. They might have also preferences such as, such as a law for anonymity, but there might also be real-world applications 
um, such as low cost remittances and uh, currency substitution in emerging markets going forward. Uh, where's the placement in the literature? So if you know the banking literature, then you have seen often the dimetypic type of framework, which has been used a lot. There typically the focus is on the asset side where banks are choosing the assets to tra and trade off the returns uh, with liquidity provision and run risk. My theory instead is focusing more on the liability side in that I um, uh, endogenize an adoption game uh, for stable coins and deposits at the ex-ante date. Uh, and relative to other papers on stable coins, a distinct feature of my work is that I focus on the payment aspect and study the determinants of adoption and fragility with a view of the risk assessment and appropriate regulation of stable coins. Uh, on this slide, as a summary of the results, I find first uh, that there are two mechanisms that can justify the concern in the regulatory community that uh, there could be an excessive adoption of uh, stable coins. The first mechanism relates to an uninternalized destabilizing composition effect, and the second one to an uninternalized network effect, which can undermine the role of bank deposits as a mean of payment. Fragility is uh, uh, taking a central focus in this paper. And I find that factors that promote stablecoin adoption typically also tend to make the marginal stablecoin holder less flighty, which means there's going to be less stablecoin runs. So um, factors that promote adoption tend to be enhancing stability of stablecoins. Moreover, factors that increase the revenues uh, of stablecoin issuers are also promoting stability as well as congestion effects, which play an important role in the crypto universe. Uh, last but not least, I find support for regulatory disclosure regimes and rules on reserves and the capitalization of stablecoin issuers. Let me walk you through the model. The model has uh, three dates and a unit continuum of uh, risk neutral consumers indexed by I. They are each endowed with $1 and they want to consume at the end of the game at day two. There's a homogeneous and divisible consumption good that's produced at day two by concept competitive consumption good sellers, which produce the good at a unit cost of $1. There are two monies, insured bank deposits and stable coins. Consumers can transfer their debt $0 endowments to day two by either holding insured bank deposits or by holding stable coins, by adopting stable coins. Um, at day two, the sellers of the consumption good are accepting deposits or stable coins of equal value. Um, since I'm not interested in the banking side, I model deposits as an outside option, uh, which gives an exogenous interest rate RD. And uh, stable coins instead are issued by a monopolistic in, uh, issuer. And here I go into more detail. The stable coin issuer is offering to convert cash into a digital token and vice versa at a one to one conversion rate at dates zero, one, and two. Um, and uh, this is not the uh, um, optimal contract here, but this is what we observe in reality, this one-to-one -one conversion promise where the leading stablecoin uh, issuers all operate a unilateral exchange rate pack to the US dollar. Uh, in the model, the stablecoin issuer may not be able to keep her promise uh, for one-to-one -one conversion at all dates. And that's because the funds collected at date zero, they are invested in a risky technology with a date two return of theta, which is stochastic following a uniform distribution. And importantly, uh, theta lower bar is smaller than one, meaning there are states of the world where the issuer is unable um, to redeem all the coins at par. Uh, an important ingredient of my model is the demand for stable coins, uh, which is generated by an interplay of two factors, first payment preferences and second conversion costs. Uh, specifically, consumers fa face idiosyncratic risk about their consumption preference at day two, and the sellers, they have a payment preference, so they might only accept one money or another money. Uh, moreover, there are conversion costs at each date, and importantly, I assume that the conversion cost at date zero is smaller than the future conversion costs, tau one and tau two at future dates, at date one and at day two. And this is generating an advantage from having the right money on hand at day two. So you have an advantage 
from uh, uh, making your conversion at date zero if you believe it's very likely that you're going to need a certain money in future because in future it's going to be more expensive to do the conversion. Um, the heterogeneity comes in as follows. There are capital G groups indexed by small g uh, where capital G can be arbitrarily large uh, and an individual consumer belonging to group G has a probability alpha G of being matched with a consumption good seller who only accepts payment in stable coins. A probability beta G to be matched with a seller who only accepts bank, bank deposits and a probability alpha minus al a probability one minus alpha minus beta to meet a seller that accepts both types of payment. Importantly, if a consumer belongs to a group with a higher G, then she has a higher expected need for stable coins because she thinks it's more likely she meets a seller that wants to be paid in stable coins. So the um, consumers belonging to groups with a high G are gonna be the crypto enthusiasts who are most eager uh, to benefit from stable coins whereas the ones with a low G um, are more inclined to hold bank deposits. Um, at date zero, there is the adoption uh, game, as I said previously, and that's modeled as a simultaneous uh, um, uh, decision where consumers to decide whether to adopt stable coins or instead to adopt, uh, to hold insured bank deposits. At date one, there is this conversion game modeled as a global game of regime change. And importantly, if the issuer is meeting redemption requests, uh, liquidation is costly, so she has to liquidate part of her long-term investment and uh, the premature divestment yields a return of little r, which is smaller than theta lower bar. So uh, uh, meeting early redemption requests is draining the resources of the issuer. And if the issuer is unable to meet her payment obligations, there's an additional bankruptcy cost psi. Uh, to close the description of the model, I would like to point out an important assumption. Uh, that has been uh, used also in the literature as a modeling trick. Uh, I assume that coin holders are active only with a probability kappa, which is smaller than R. So in this way, I uh, uh, exclude rationing at date one. So at date one, the issuer is always going to be able to meet the redemption requests of active coin holders. But of course, at date two, the issuer might not be able uh, um, to uh, meet her promises and might go bankrupt. Um, this assumption can be relaxed, but the model becomes much less tractable, but key insights by and large go through. Um, let me skip this graphic illustration of the model and uh, uh, come to the analysis. So the game is solved backwards. First, we look at the conversion game at date one, and then we look at the adoption game at date zero. Um, so uh, how does the conversion game look like? So when solving the conversion game, we take the adoption rate, which is denoted as capital N as given, and we can find uh, using the global games methodology that there exists a unique threshold equilibrium uh, that looks as follows. The issue faces a run at date one for all fundamental realizations theta that, below, that fall below a certain threshold theta star, which is given implicitly by this condition here. Uh, and this condition here is essentially uh, an aggregation of the group-specific indifference conditions um, of the um, stablecoin holders. And that's uh, also why you can see here that uh, this term here, gamma upper bar, is reflecting the weighted average over the payment type of the individual coin holders. So this is basically the weighted average of the gammas over the coin holders. And for that reason, the uh, composition of the stable coin adopters is going to matter for stability because we can relate this um, gamma upper bar to uh, theta star, which is governing the probability of stable coin runs. Uh, let me come to the key comparative statics, which you can see here in this table. Uh, the first three comparative static results are uh, consistent with what you would expect from the banking literature, which gives us some confidence that the stable coins run model is uh, plausible. Uh, first, I find that an increase in bankruptcy costs is associated with a higher probability of bank runs because there's less resources available in case of a run. So uh, uh, coin holders are gonna become more flighty. Uh, the fraction of active coin holders kappa uh, is also associated with a higher probability of stable coin runs because they exert more pressure on the issuer. Uh, 
and an increase in the liquidation value instead is stabilizing, it's reducing the probability of runs because a higher liquidation value uh, gives the issuer mis uh, more resources to stem against redemption requests. Uh, the fourth comparative static is one that I think is relevant for the crypto universe. Uh, I find that the probability of runs is decreasing in the conversion cost that they one. So if, for instance, due to congestion effects, uh, uh, the conversion cost of that one goes up and I endogenize it in an extension also of this model for the time being it's exogenous, then we have that the probability of runs go down. So that's a stabilizing effect here in the system. Last but not least, uh, we have a comparative static result on the composition effect. Uh, specifically, I find that uh, the average relative preference for stablecoin payments is negatively associated uh, with the probability um, of the bank runs. Why is that the case? Uh, sorry, is, is uh, um, uh, reducing the probability of bank runs. Why is that the case? If I have stable coin holders that are more eager to hold stable coins that have a higher gamma, then this is driving up the um, average gamma in the pool of stable coin holders. And as a result of that, it's uh, reducing uh, the flightiness of coin holders in the conversion game and reducing the probability of stable coin runs. Uh, and this is a, a destabilizing composition effect that's going to be also at the core of an efficiency result, which I will show you in two slides. Um, after having looked at the uh, conversion game at date one, we can go to the stable coin adoption game at date zero. Um, in date zero, when uh, deciding whether or not to adopt stable coins, the uh, consumers, uh, they are looking at their group specific benefit from adopting stable coins, which is given by this formula here. They essentially look at the um, expected return when adopting stable coins and compare that with the expected return uh, when holding uh, bank deposits. Uh, interestingly, this uh, importantly, this uh, benefit from stable coin adoption is increasing in the groups. So if you're more uh, uh, likely to meet a seller that uh, um, only accepts stable coins, of course, you have a higher benefit from holding stable coins. It's decreasing the deposit rate. Higher deposit rate instead makes deposits more attractive relative to stable coins. And the uh, benefit from stable coins is also decreasing in theta star. So it's decreasing in the probability of stable coin runs. So if there's a higher risk of devaluation, you're also less inclined to hold stable coins. And this uh, gives me a uh, relation between the adoption rate and the probability of stable coin runs. So we find that uh, belief about a higher probability of stable coin runs at date zero is associated with a lower adoption rate. And um, based on this destabilizing composition effect from the previous slide and this comparative static, we can do an um, uh, uh, equilibrium analysis and we can find that there uh, exists a unique equilibrium of the adoption game. Now, based on this results, as a next step, we look at the efficiency analysis. Um, and here, uh, I like to address the concern of regulators about a widespread adoption, perhaps rapid adoption of stable coins. Think about Facebook Libra, for instance. Um, and I want to look at that through the lens of my model and try to understand uh, whether there could be scope for inefficient excessive adoption. And there I um, uh, uh, focus on two uninternalized effects. First, the destabilizing composition effect that we just um, um, uh, discussed. And second, uh, an uninternalized erosion of bank deposits. Uh, coming to the uh, uh, destabilizing composition effect, let's have a look uh, graphically at a model where uh, there are two groups of agents, group one and two. Um, and uh, what I do here in this graph, I'm plotting their respective benefits uh, or the payoff differential from adopting stable coins um, against the adoption rate. And what we see here is that the um, benefit from adopting stable coins starts uh, sloping downwards whenever multiple groups of coin holders are adopting stable coins. And that's because of the destabilizing composition effect, which makes it less attractive to adopt stable coins. In equilibrium, it's going to be the case that uh, the coin holders here, uh, um, uh, the marginal coin holder belonging to group one here is going to be just indifferent between adopting stable coins and not. And we can find 
uh, uh, NVNet can now compare this equilibrium adoption rate to uh, the constraint planner problem. And we find that uh, the marginal adopt of stable coins is not internalizing that she poses a negative externality on other coin holders through the destabilizing composition effect. Graphically, you can see that the benefit from adopting stable coins in green is rather small compared to the cost imposed on the other stable coin holders by making the stable coin uh, less stable through the increased adoption. Uh, so to sum up, we have uh, the potential for excessive adoption due to a destabilizing competition effect, uh, composition effect that's not internalized by the marginal stable coin adopter. Um, now, if we extend the model uh, and introduce network effects, uh, this result can potentially be overturned. Um, and the way I do this is I um, uh, assume that uh, the probability, the uh, common component of the probability of meeting a uh, seller that only accepts stable coins is increasing in the stable coin adoption rate um, as stable coins are more prevalent. Uh, instead, the um, probability of meeting a seller that only accepts bank deposits um, is declining in the stable coin adoption rate. And if these two effects are sufficiently strong, they can overturn the destabilizing composition effect. And it can be the case that a higher adoption is actually stabilizing. So it's really important to uh, um, think about both effects when trying to evaluate whether high adoption is stabilizing or not. There are some caveats to this when we introduce uh, positive network effects, multiple equilibria of the adoption game uh, can emerge from a recruitment of regulators. That's not very desirable because then you have potential for uh, uh, rapid shifts in adoption uh, because the beliefs about stability change. Um, and uh, we can also see that the origin of the positive uh, network effects matters. Uh, and to drive home this message, um, we can develop a second uh, um, uh, reason why uh, stablecoin adoption might be uh, too high. And that's because of the uninternalized erosion of bank deposits. Uh, for that, suppose uh, that a wider adoption of stablecoins is reducing the probability that uh, deposits are accepted. Uh, uh, formally, uh, we assume that uh, alpha prime is positive and beta prime is zero to isolate this effect. Uh, and here's the case that the marginal doctor uh, doesn't internalize that she poses a negative externality, not on other stable coin holders, but this time on the depositors, on the ones who decided not to hold stable coins. Um, because uh, by um, her decision to adopt stable coins, she makes it less likely that uh, these depositors are going to meet a, a consumption good seller that is accepting the deposits um, as a payment. Um, I have a few more extensions uh, um, of the model to uh, try to analyze uh, the different uh, determinants um, of uh, stablecoin adoption and stability over and above uh, what we have discussed so far. Uh, from a regulatory viewpoint, uh, there is an interest in thinking about uh, moral hazard problems uh, of stablecoin issues because we see in practice uh, uh, that uh, some of them have uh, rather risky investments. Uh, and there's also concerns about the quality of disclosure. Um, and uh, let me um, look at this extension. Um, and uh, you can refer to the paper if you have interest in some of the other extensions um, that you can see here on this list. So uh, the way I introduce the moral hazard problem is I introduce a portfolio choice problem where uh, on the asset side, the issuer can choose between the low risk and the high risk portfolio. Uh, and the high risk portfolio choice is essentially modeled as a mean preserving spread in the distribution of thetas in combination uh, with a reduction of the liquidation value R. So here it's clearly socially optimal uh, if the issuer chooses the low risk portfolio, um, which has a lower uh, spread in the theta distribution and a higher liquidation value. Um, and therefore also uh, gives rise to a, a more stable stable coin. Um, however, uh, the uh, incentives of the issuer are misaligned. And uh, 
Uh, one question is whether a regulatory disclosure regime can help uh, to overcome uh, this problem and to implement the efficient risk choice. I find that this is not always the case, and that's because uh, the uh, issuer is only implementing the low risk choice uh, if the sensitivity of the threshold, thresholds theta star and n star is sufficiently high. Um, that's a little bit different to what you typically know from the banking literature, where with transparency, the price of debt is risk adjusted. Here we have a unilateral exchange rate pack. So what matters is only the sensitivity of the thresholds um, to the risk choice of the portfolio. And uh, given that the regulatory disclosure regime doesn't necessarily help always, uh, there are clear implications for additional regulation, such as capital requirements um, and the regulation of resource um, of issuers. Um, I have another um, uh, extension also on stable coins lending that's also related to one of uh, um, Alex's papers, um, where I introduce a stable coins lending game in between the adoption stage and the conversion stage. I do this in a way as it's done in the um, uh, traditional currency attack literature in the paper by uh, Corsetti. Um, and uh, I introduce oh. large borrower that is borrowing stable coins, um, which um, Stop, actually, you've got three minutes. Yeah, which is actually uh, um, uh, 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 great if the large uh, borrower is uh, not a speculator, because uh, by uh, offering some interest on stable coins, uh, she's actually promoting uh, stable coin adoption because um, it becomes more attractive to adopt stable coins if you can earn interest as long as uh, the stable coins are still relatively stable. Um, if it's, of course, likely that the, this large borrower is a speculator, then this benefits might be eroded. Um, to sum up, um, I uh, propose a framework in this paper that is um, modifying existing theories of bank runs and currency attacks by modeling stable coin adoption and by incorporating features that I think are important in the stable coins market. Uh, especially this payments role. Um, a key ingredient in my model is uh, the demand for stable coins, uh, which is uh, uh, generated by a heterogeneity in the induced payment preference of the potential adopters of stable coins of the consumers. Uh, the main results are first, uh, I identify uh, potential downsides from wider adoption. Uh, specifically, I isolate uh, two uh, externalities that uh, can lead to excessive adoption of stable coins. Second, I provide some insights for the risk assessment of stable coins from the study of the determinants of stable coin adoption and fragility. Uh, third, I find support for regulatory disclosure regime and rules on reserves and the capitalization of stable coin issues. And last but not least, uh, what I didn't have time to show you here, where I have to refer to the paper, I uh, offer a set of new testable applications. Thanks a lot uh, for your attention, and I'm really looking forward to Alex's discussion of the paper. Before we go there, um, okay. there's one clarification question. Well, I'll treat it as just a clarification now. If we want to go into more depth, we can do that in the Q&A. Yeah. Uh, Ask the question, can stable coins choose to put their money in bank deposits as well instead of investing in a risky project or asset? Uh, stable coin issuers or stable coin holders? Uh, uh, I interpret that as stable coin issuers. But it may be answered for both. So, so, uh, so, okay. So, uh, um, it's going to be the case that uh, so, so that's the slide I didn't show you. So, it's going to be the case here in equilibrium that we're going to have a threshold on gamma, and uh, the consumers belonging to a group with a high gamma find uh, stable coins more attractive. They have a higher probability of needing uh, um, of benefiting from stable coins as payments at day two, whereas uh, the ones with a low gamma they go for uh, uh, bank deposits. Uh, the stablecoin issuer collects the uh, um, funds from the uh, groups with a high gamma and invests them in a risky investment project. Uh, then in the extension, when I look at the moral hazard problem, I allow for an, um, uh, risk choice, uh, a risk management problem here of the issuer. So we can decide whether to invest in a more or less risky portfolio. And uh, you could also model that as a portfolio choice problem where you have a risky asset and uh, um, a safe asset, and you decide on the mix between the risky and the safe asset. 
Okay, okay, I think that, so, so in, in theory, it would be possible for them to go riskless and put it all in insured deposits uh, in a too big to fail bank, say. Yeah, that's not my focus, but in principle, if you introduce the risk management problem, um, they can go fully safe. Okay. And I have an extension also in the paper where I discuss then um, e-money and, and uh, narrow banking, which, which goes in that direction as well. Okay, I think we need to uh, move on to uh, Alex now. Uh, so discussing the paper will be Alex Van uh, the chief of the uh, macro prudential policy analysis section of the Financial Stability Division of the Federal Reserve Board. And uh, Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Oh, let me share my slides. So, okay, all good. Can you see them? Great. So, um, thanks a lot for the organizers for inviting me to discuss this very nice paper. So I enjoyed a lot uh, reading it, but let me jump uh, directly to it. Uh, starting with uh, some basics uh, for stable coins, what are they? I mean, they're digital assets that they promise to maintain the constant price of $1 and be redeemable at par on demand. Now, most uh, of uh, these stable coins that we have out there, like Tether or uh, USDC, DAI, and other stable coin, they're mostly collateralized by other assets. So they get uh, their, uh, th th their safety from them. The issue is that a lot of these assets can be risky and illiquid. Now, this is not something new in uh, financial intermediation. This is very similar to what we would have in, uh, uh, in banks with uninsured deposits and liquid assets or money market funds. So it is very, very reasonable to expect that these stable coins will be exposed to run risk. What is the big difference of stable coins from other money market instruments like deposits, money market funds? The big difference is that they don't provide any direct compensation to holders for this run risk. And what is the reason for that? Stable coins pay no interest. Now we can argue whether this is an optimal outcome at a contracting problem, whether this is regulation, because you're trying to avoid being classified as securities, the thyroid test and all, or it is an asymmetric information thing. But I mean, let's take it as given, they don't pay interest. And this is a very important thing. Why is that? Because then, we really need to ask ourselves, okay, if they don't pay interest and they're risky, where does the demand for stable coin come from? This is a first order question. Now, another question which is related but distinct to that is, how can you maintain your peg in secondary markets traded continuously? So this question, of course, are related, but they're a little bit distinct. Uh, this paper uh, tackles very nicely the first question and focuses on the role of stable coins to facilitate payments. And I will get more into that because I think there, is, uh, there are many novel aspects uh, in, in this thing. But at the very high level, what, what is the paper saying? The paper is saying that if stable coins can be used more efficiently for some time of payments than other private money, then there will be demand for them, right? I mean, you will demand, uh, you, you will demand these things. And how can we, Actually, this is a quote uh, from, you know, I should go to other people. So the idea, the idea is the following. If I am only willing to exchange my dollars, for, I'm only willing to exchange my dollars in a foreign country for uh, the local currency that has the risk of devaluation. We can imagine these currencies. If I know that I will need local currency to go and buy a coffee at the local store. Otherwise, I will not do that. I will use my credit cards. So I will only be willing to take the risk of devaluation, inflation from one day to another, or you can think of this, if there is demand. And that's, that's the basic, that's, that's, that's where the paper starts from. Now, uh, Christoph already mentioned this uh, in another paper with Gary Gordon and people from the Fed, uh, we are investigating a complementary channel where the demand for stablecoin comes. It will be to take leverage speculative positions in crypto, empirically and theoretically, but I'm here to talk about uh, Christoph's paper. So just, you know, I leave it there. So what is the sketch of the model? So there are three periods. It's a simple, tractable model. There are three periods. There's a stable coin issuer and there are heterogeneous agents with respect to their payment preferences that they choose between 
insured deposits and stable coins. What happens in this period? At equal zero, the issuer caters the demand for stable coins and invest the process in a single risk and liquid project. There was already a question about that. They relaxed the, the request of relaxes this in an extension and considers the portfolio problem. As an aside, I think this is a first of the issue that you should elevate in the paper. So to solve the total optimization problem. I think it doesn't belong in the extension, it belongs to the main part of the paper, and you have already done the work. Um, uh, now, at equal one, some agents become active and some become passive. The active agents decide whether to redeem their stable coins in a global game. This is the typical demo, difficult, stand pause and stuff. There's nothing, you know, weird there. They borrow a trick from some of the, actually, the mutual fund paper that Christoph said that say that only uh, some people are active. Now, I never like this assumption, but people are doing it. In this particular th case, I think it's a little bit problematic if we want to be realistic how to think about Ramsey stable coins. And the reason is that this, uh, th these things are trading 24-7 decentralized blockchains. There's full transparency about the price. You can even set up an alert in your smartphone app to see where the price goes down. And there is a lot of social media presence. Now, I think this is not to criticize your paper. In general, I think it's a very important aspect to think that runs happen faster. And this is what the March 2023 20, episode showed us even for banks. Bank runs have much faster than before, so we shouldn't forget about that. Now, T equal to, if the stablecoin is solvent, agents can use tokens for certain payments with some probability. If it is insolvent, they get a process. That's the model. Now, the key thing of the paper, and I think the big novelty of it, is the payment type probabilities. So what's the key aspect? Agents have heterogeneous preferences, such that with some probability, they prefer goods that require payment, either in stable coins or deposits, the probability source. There is a common component and the idiosyncratic component of these probabilities. Let me start with the idiosyncratic component. The idiosyncratic component ranks each agent individually, such that some people have higher probability, some have lower probability. It's completely exogenous. The first inefficiency that Christoph source comes directly from this idiosyncratic component. And the idea there is the average pool will determine the RAM probability, but as you add more people that they have lowered these probabilities, you deteriorate the pool, the probability goes up. This is an externality. This is a novel externality. It's very nice. I like it a lot. There is another common component, which is what we call the network effects, that is increasing on the stable coin circulation at equal to. This gives you the, the AN, alpha N, or the beta 1 minus N in the slides of Christoph. Now, I'm less enthusiastic about this component uh, for two reasons. First is a pure modeling theory thing. It is inconsistent with a number of coins circulation in not out of equilibrium paths in the global game. So this component only depends on the number of circulation at equal zero. If you want to do it properly as a common component, you have to introduce it in the out of equilibrium paths of the global game. It is doable, but it is work. The more important reason why I'm less enthusiastic about that is it's a little bit ad hoc. And I think it is very, when we talk about contagion externalities, it is a contagion in the old search version, not the, the one that you saw. It's very important, uh, you saw in the blockchain, you know, with the gas fees. It's very important to microfound it. And there are two ways you can do it. You can do, direct, you can do random search with bargaining. You can do directed search. Either way it works. I think it's very important because we need to know which way the matching inefficiency goes and which way the congestion externality goes. So I think this is an important part if you want I mean, it's an important part. Let's leave it there. Now, it's also doable because you can do network effects by increasing returns to scale matching functions. There is a recent paper by Antonio Coppola, Krishna Murthy, and Zheng Xing Su that they do this. So you can have a look at this. It's actually a currency adaption paper as well, not a stable conduction, currency adaption. So they do it with increasing returns to scale. Alex, you got three minutes. Fantastic. Thank you, Larry. Now, as far as I'm concerned, there is already a lot of novelty in the first inefficiency you saw. And I would personally I would be happy to leave it there, but you know, uh, the network effects do not seem to matter for keen science. So you may consider, you know, pushing it as in the end because th there are some, there are these issues. I don't know. This may be me or others, but you know, there are these issues. Now the second thing that actually, you know, it 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 it, it gets this is running. I mean, it's, it's it's a very nice paper. So you want to say, okay, this is the adaptation. You understand this happening. 
okay, the theoretical point is very straightforward, we get it, but could the, the paper may benefit a little bit from the quantification of the mechanism to see how economically significant it is, and that will get you, I'll, I'll explain why. Let's go to see, the, 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 the main premise of the paper is that stable coins are used for payments. So there's a convenience yield, right? This is what gives them uh, their demand. How, is, how big is this convenience yield? If we go to a paper by Skander on the convenience yield on deposit, it is about 80 basis points in recent years. So if we think that this is a very reasonable estimate or an upper bound, if you like, for the convenience yield for stable coins because they cannot be used for everything, can we justify this huge increase from 20 billion to 200 billion in just one year? So this is, I think this is a first order question as well. I'm not sure that with the underlying big risk, you can justify it. It's definitely a component, and we definitely a component if Libra is adopted. But here, for this you know, market, and you know, the policy implications for this market, anyways, it's important to quantify. So let me say overall, this is one of the early papers on global game approach to stable coins. It's a very nice paper. Uh, I would really recommend that you go and read it in detail. The focus is on the role of stable coins for payments. And uh, I think, uh, Christopher, you're making a very nice contribution uh, with the heterogeneity on the payment types. Thanks so much. Christoph, do you have uh, brief comments and response? Yeah, thanks a lot for this great discussion. So that's definitely uh, food for thought. Um, maybe a, a, a few um, a thoughts. So regarding um, the convenience yield, I also think it would be uh, really important to to try to learn more about that. It's an empirical question, and um, from from my reading of the literature generally, uh, the use of stable coins and crypto uh, has a lot to do with. Um, uh, illicit illicit activities, money laundering, organized crime, and so on. So I guess that can be very strong reasons uh, uh, that, that that lead to adoption for some, right? And that can also potentially explain rapid growth. Uh, but 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 it's very difficult to say, and I don't have the insights uh, empirically. Uh, but but that's definitely something interesting uh, to look at. And from the viewpoint of my paper, I really try to be a bit agnostic about the different use cases. And I'm thinking of uh, different groups of consumers, of uh, groups of consumers with different use cases. And maybe going forward, there will be a very strong use case in uh, currency substitution in emerging markets if uh, uh, wallet providers are penetrating that market. And, and uh, that could lead to a lot of adoption, perhaps, or not. Um, and um, I um, also think uh, uh, that uh, your comment on uh, the uh, um, network effects is really great. And uh, that's definitely something uh, that I uh, have to think a little bit more about uh, and have to see, as you said, how how I position it in the paper and uh, um, how much deeper I want to go uh, uh, into uh, the micro foundations. Uh, admittedly, now it's uh, relatively ad hoc and it's modeled a little bit as in the uh, paper I cited uh, by uh, Itai Agu and co-authors. Um, and uh, there is definitely scope to to do more on that if I choose to to go in the direction. Maybe it's it's good to to get some more bilateral feedback uh, uh, from you to, to to see whether it's worth to do it. Thanks a lot. Okay. Well, while we're waiting for some more questions to roll in, I wanted to pick up on one of the points that Alex raised about um, how stable coins having a, uh, managed to maintain their peg with secondary trading because you modeled this as a mutual fund where redemption is required. But in fact, what we frequently see is, is that they choose not to redeem it, uh, not to impose those liquidation costs on their holders, but instead uh, let those who want to run away do so at a discount in the market. Um, have you thought much about that and what that might mean for the model? Um, no, I didn't uh, uh, think too much about it. I mean, if you... Um... If you have uh, in, introduced trading and and uh, prices that are revealing um, information um, in this type of model, you have to be very careful how you do it with the timing um, in order to to uh, keep uh, the uh, global games framework um, uh, going and get a unique equilibrium of the conversion game. 
Uh, that's that's one aspect to to uh, keep in mind. But there are possible ways to do that uh, on a, a higher level. Um, I, uh, it is the case that that uh, the leading stablecoin operators they they um, have um, certain uh, um, agents that are helping them to to do this um, open market interventions uh, in order to stabilize the pack. And there are certain types of arrangements, and uh, that's also something that uh, I would have to learn more about first to 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 better see how how I could potentially um, address address that. Francesca, you have a question. Hi, uh, Larry. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I have uh, kind of like two questions. One is more model specific, and one I guess it's broader. So I'll ask quickly both. The first one is uh, how uh, dependent uh, is your uh, externality effect, I guess the network one, on the assumption of a monopolistic issuer of stable coins? And the reason why I ask is that uh, it seems intuitive to me to think that um, there may be an incentive for stable coin adopters or crypto enthusiasts, whatever, to uh, sort of partition themselves into different sets, into different groups that uses one stable coin versus another one so for example the the more enthusiasts or the ones who value their privacy the most or the ones who are sympathetic with russia the most they might be more willing to uh use tether other ones uh might prefer to use usdc uh so the externality um i i wonder how much that externality effect depends on your modeling choice of having one stable coin and one monopolistic stable coin issuer that doesn't, is, as far as I understood, that does not allow this sort of like partition in different uh, sets of stable coins uh, or monies adopted in equilibrium that might have different characteristics about uh, this externality effect. Um, the second one, I guess it's, it's a, um, maybe a bit unfair, but uh, and I'm, I'm sorry if I missed that, but what is really in this model the element that distinguishes stable coins? Why is this not a model of banks instead of stable coins versus deposit? Why is this not a model of bank deposits versus cash? Um, let me maybe start with the first question. So, so, so that's really interesting. So, um, I have um, uh, formally looked at uh, uh, free entry to the stable coins market, but uh, still uh, only um, at um, at a model where where you know you 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 have one stable coin issuer, but uh, free entry. Um, then um, I. I have been thinking also about multiple uh, stable coins. Then, um, in order to get the type of situation that you describe, where some might prefer one over the other, uh, you would have to introduce some additional element in the model. Uh, maybe uh, um, uh, you know move away from risk neutrality or something uh, in order to have some preferring the uh, risky gambling stable coin. Uh, uh, whereas others go more for the safe stable coin, right? But uh, that's definitely something that's potentially relevant and interesting coming more to the core of your question uh, uh, regarding the uh, role of the network effects and all that. Um, if you believe that uh, the uh, uh, network effect um, has a um, uh, market-specific uh, component uh, and a uh, issue-specific component, uh, it would be probably uh, uh, important to uh, to think which one is more important than the other. Uh, what I did in the paper in an extension, I looked at the uh, fixed costs of operation, which you can, uh, to some extent, qualitatively uh, interpret in similar ways. So if you are a large stablecoin issuer, uh, you are better able to cover your fixed costs of operation than a smaller one, right? So, so, so that gives you also some gains. But uh, that's something that's definitely uh, uh, worth to discover more. And for some of your questions, I think we need additional ingredients in the model uh, to get at it. Um, your other question uh, was about, uh, now I forgot what it was about. It was just uh, it was just about what is it really in the model about stable coins? Why is this not a model of, um, instead of stable coins versus deposits, of banks and bank deposits versus cash? 
Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's also a good question. So so uh, generally, um, when I th started to think about this 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 model, I uh, was in really intrigued by the observation that the uh, crypto crowd seems to be very heterogeneous. Um, and that's why uh, this idea from from the uh, construction of the demand side comes from uh, to the extent that some sh something like that also matters for uh, traditional uh, uh, banks. Uh, uh, it, it also applies in a way there. I mean, if you think about literatures on uh, institutional investors and so on, there might be also different groups of investors um, that have different uh, um, uh, uh, benefits from certain investment products and that, that might be more or less flighty. So to that extent, it could also apply more broadly. Uh, but I didn't think about that carefully. And it was really the motivation that this crypto crowd is really heterogeneous that that uh, uh, was guiding me in, in, in how to model that. Thank you. I see uh, Preti Prasad has her, has her hand up. Did you have a question that you wanted to ask? You're unmuted. Uh, I think you can unmute yourself now, can't you? Okay, either I'm not handling the technology right or there's not a question here. Let me switch back to the uh, uh, to uh, Todd to uh, ask a question. Okay, uh, thanks, Larry. Yeah, yeah, Christoph, I think this is super interesting. I wanted to follow up kind of on on Francesca's last question. So, you know, like thinking about stablecoin adoption, I'm thinking about sort of what is the the comparison or what is the relevant decision margin. So, so you've kind of got a model where everyone's thinking about I'm either going to use stable coins or bank deposits for something, and then different people would value those differently. But and I, I have to admit, I, I sort of struggle with who uses stable coins and why. But you know, if I think that at least part of it is about, you know, I, I want to trade on the blockchain. I want, I'm speculating on Bitcoin versus something else, and stable coins are sort of a useful way of of running those trades. Then is it, for those types of people, are bank deposits a relevant comparison, or, or you know, you know, because the bank deposit you can't you can't trade on chain. For them, is it more about if if there were no stable coins, I'd just be trading Bitcoin versus Ether instead of Bitcoin versus Tether and Tether versus Ether. Um, I just wanted to get what are your thoughts on that? How important is the stable coins versus bank deposit deposits margin, or how would we get a sense of? How important that margin is versus stable coins versus some other crypto asset. That's a good question. Maybe Alex is actually in a better position to uh, to 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 answer it, given that uh, his paper is uh, making a link between the speculative demand in crypto and uh, the demand for stable coins, right? But um, uh, I think that. Um, that uh, uh, generally, um, if you think about uh, uh, specul speculators, retail speculators, I mean, one casino is to 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 go into, um, you know, um, uh, uh, this uh, game shop type of stocks, right? Or or uh, uh, um, big tech stocks, and another casino is, is crypto, you know. And for one casino, you you uh, use fiat. For the other, you have. Uh, the stable coins. So, so there's certainly uh, uh, some uh, um, um, users that uh, uh, you know use both. Um, generally, um, um, as you said, uh, there um, are specific reasons why uh, a lot of crypto investors use stable coins because they can reduce their trading costs in the crypto universe. And uh, um, my model is in a way stylized, but uh, you know, when I talk about a seller that is only accepting stable coins and your consumption preference to buy from the seller, what I kind of also mean to encompass is a situation where you know you are likely to be interested in in uh, doing some speculative crypto uh, um, investments in the future. You know that already now, and uh, that's why you you're adopting the stable coin, right? So I so I try to interpret that uh, relatively broad broadly. 
So the quick, uh, can I ask one question, Larry? Uh, to to quick, so uh, sure. I, I I cannot raise my hand as a whole. So, so I'm wondering. Uh, uh, so like Alex last point. So um, it it made me wonder. It may be hard to justify um, with the eighty basis point and the convenience yield. So I'm wondering maybe uh one motivation is about the heterogeneous belief. So maybe people are super uh optimistic about crypto or stable coin. That driving on top of the eighty percent, uh, eighty basis point, they may be really go for it. So, but is it any different with the heterogeneous belief and heterogeneous demand in your model? Are they the same thing or uh, have some difference? Uh, so, if I understood your question right, no, there's no link. So, so I mean, stable coins don't really offer an upside, uh, as long as we we uh, don't introduce a uh, a stable coin lending so that you can earn some interest right um and uh yeah so um so there's no rule uh, role for you know opti optimistic beliefs on the return of stable coins that are justifying stable coin adoption but but maybe the, uh some people are worried about the downside of crypto so they want you to park their money in something stable then it provides a safe haven that kind of heterogeneous belief on crypto that may drive people to hold stable coin. I'm wondering maybe it is isomorphic to some heterogeneous demand in your model. Then, okay, we can speak to Alex's question. So some of the elements look like uh, 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 can justify the AC basic point in the data. I would have to think about that more carefully. It, it, I think it relates to Todd's previous question because then the adoption game would be uh, basically, or the choice would be uh, ex ante about uh, you know, uh, crypto assets uh, that that are not stable coins, like like Bitcoin, for instance, and versus stable coin, right? Bitcoin versus stable coin would be then the ex ante stage, right? Yeah, and that's part of what I had in mind. When and when you think about it that way, I, you know, the convenience yield could be more than eighty basis points, right? It's it's not uh, tether versus uh, treasuries because treasuries you just can't use for this. So uh, I see Nathan Palmer has his hand up. Uh, Nathan, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, a thought that occurred to me recently, listening to some podcast, crypto folks talking about crypto things, and there's a fair number of like CEOs of crypto companies. And one of the things that a couple of them like uh, were complaining about with each other, this is when SVB and Signature were having their troubles, was that um, they basically paid their employees in stablecoin. And there was concerns that their employees, you know, USDC, I think, you know, like depegged for a little bit. And so there was concern that their employees were going to have interruptions to their payments. I had originally just assumed that these sorts of like, I did not even think of the, about the, the, the possibility that software engineers were being paid in stablecoins. Do we know, do we have any data on I feel like the answer is no, but do we have any data on how many people doing software development type jobs or things like that are being paid in stablecoin versus regular fiat? That's my question. I also heard about that before, uh, uh, about instances where where uh, some are paid in stablecoins, um, but uh, maybe somebody else uh, in the audience knows more about that. So we are almost at noon, but we can go a little bit longer. Jonathan, you have a question? Uh, I just provided a little bit of information. Just want to provide a little bit of information about the usage of stable coin. Uh, so we, we have some studies at the Bank of Canada. So according to that, basically the usage of stable coin for, for uh, payment of goods and services very very much very limited right now. It's only around maybe zero point zero four three percent compared to uh, Visa transactions. But the main use case is really right now seems to be as a vehicle currency for non U.S. based centralized exchanges as a vehicle currencies. Another usage is really for uh, some margin and settlement assets for crypto derivatives. And finally, would the uh, this stablecoin is used for for as the uh, uh, funding asset for lending platform in DeFi. So, so given that maybe uh, one way maybe is 
for us to to be saying is how can we think about the role of stable coin and how uh, in financial trade and how that may affect the, the measure of convenience yield. Thanks. Any more? Well, I think that's pretty much it, unless somebody's got a, another question they'd like to ask. Um, if uh, there are no more questions, um, I'll turn it back over uh, to, um, I guess it was Russell, it was- uh, I'll take Todd, it. Todd, okay. okay. I'll turn it over well, to Todd. Then. Thanks everyone. Thanks Christoph for a great presentation and Alex for a very informative discussion. Thanks Larry for moderating. Thanks everyone for attending. I'll just throw up one last time the um, the announcement about the November conference at the Ricks Bank, and I hope you'll uh, consider uh, submitting. And, uh, and please stay posted for announcements about future sessions. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks everybody for the questions and feedback. Thanks a lot. Highly appreciate it. Thank you.